If I may be so frank, I'd like to begin by admitting I have rewritten this talk six times. In this version, I speak to you today, the seventh, I made myself write in a notebook, in pen, so it wouldn't be erased. Eventually, I figured that was the only way I'd get it done and speak in front of you all today. I think I only doubted myself so much because I was, as they say, a very lost girl. I had an idea of what my life would look like, and I didn't know what I would do. I still do not know those things, but lost I am no longer. That is why I speak to you all today. Growing up, I never dared to question what I was doing. The knowledge, the textbooks, the grades, it seemed so righteous, so noble. But what one doesn't predict is that in the hopes of being an intellectual, they can make themselves a fool. For a long time, I went to sleep restless, woke up exhausted, and asked myself what it was I did to be so young and already so tired. And perhaps what made it worse was that I wasn't alone. So many of us think we're growing, but we're only getting older. Because as we urgently absorb all this knowledge, we yearn for the answers to completely different questions. We look to the test score, to the red and green ink, but we want to see who will become, what we'll work toward, our lives, if they'll be happy ones, proper ones, wealthy ones. And for the assurance of that, we are desperate, so desperate, some subject, some assignment, some grade, some teacher, some accolade, tell us, tell us we will succeed. Because we don't know. Deep down, that's all we long to know, the unknown. It's as simple and as complicated as that. I think in this part of our lives, there's a lot we try to guarantee. That's the pressure. That's why that percentage matters. That's why your pencil shivers. And that's why that piece of paper holds so much weight. Whatever it is we're doing, we're waiting. Waiting as if each letter grade will piece together to create our new names. Our diplomas, the keys to our new homes and cars and lives. The futures we have so strenuously worked and guaranteed for ourselves all this time. The futures we deserve. I suppose my first revelation was that, as hard as I work, it will never go to plan. And that is what I first must share with you today. To preface, I spend quite a lot of my time reading. And in the past 12 months, I've read about 52 books, spanning from the paragons of classic academia to translations of essential texts from around the world. But what I remember striking me most distinctly was a one-page piece written by an anonymous elder, whom I'll never know. Anyways, they made the following point. Most of our generation was born around the turn of the century. So let's imagine we were born in 1900 instead. World War I begins when you're 15, and 40 million people die by your 18th birthday. For the next two years commence the Spanish flu, killing at least 20 million people. Just when you begin to feel established at 29, the Great Depression begins and the world economy is at the brink of collapse. World War II begins when you're 39, the deadliest conflict in human history. It ends when you're 45. Smallpox is also an epidemic back then, killing an additional 300 million people during your lifetime. Somehow, you survived. God forbid that repeats itself. What plan of ours could possibly fathom that? You see, our largest hope and our foremost worry, this grand future that steals us of our youth is completely out of our control. It's not worth 
trying to mold it anymore. And history has shown us that. And we will be tossed in the Herculean hands of the economy, politics, and circumstance unless we change, lest we stop attempting to plan the future and prepare ourselves. My name is Sabina C. Paniker. I'm 15 currently. And I speak to you all today to propose how we can use the burdens, books, and films of our youth to grow instead of just getting older. The opportunity to trust yourself. Now, I'd hate to be preachy about this because for a long time, it's why I never believed anyone who spoke of it. Instead, I think it's best I tell you the story that prompted my realization. I've met many people who have gone away, but one who hasn't left my memory is a woman named Lucia. I met her when she was around 70 at a dinner party one summer in southern Spain. She sat just about where you are and recounted to all of us the time she performed her first major surgery. It seems a monumental occasion, but she actually spoke of it rather simply. She went into the room, it had no windows, and under the light was a man with an open heart. Of course, she'd seen a heart before, but this one belonged to a very young man, she said. She was so shaken by the sight initially that she had trouble focusing and keeping her hands still. She genuinely didn't think she could do it. But in the end, she did her job, and the man could open his eyes. But she looked at me, 10 or 11 at the time, when she said nothing could have possibly prepared her for that. Not a decade of training, not multiple degrees, not a lifetime only the experience itself. I never saw her again, but I think about her story still, for it could happen to any of us, just with a different career, in a different room, and with something different in front of us. We might end up possessing all the attainable knowledge, but never the confidence. We were never taught to trust ourselves, and clearly we don't do so enough. That's only because every opportunity we have to is disguised as a problem we wish to forget. The things we grapple with, that difficult conversation, that difficult person, that presentation, TED talk, pro a project, event, risk, are all opportunities, really. Opportunities to see ourselves prevail, and if anything, opportunities to make mistakes so we don't make them again. Lu Lucia didn't have that privilege. Her mistake that time would have been permanent. Us, with our youth, do. So why mustn't we make every mistake while the consequences don't last forever? Find out what works and what doesn't, what makes us happy and what makes us sad, and just stick to that. Because really, we don't need to know every single facet of our futures, only that we'll make our way through them. Because when you know yourself, you trust yourself. And when you truly trust yourself, you know that in any situation or circumstance, you'll be okay. And that's enough. Ultimately, it is only because she watched herself complete that first surgery that Lucia's career spanned four decades. Now, the relief I'm able to offer is that difficult situations aren't the only things we can look to to navigate our lives. We can also look to what's not supposed to be real, fiction. Aside from my aforementioned pile of literature, in the past three years, I've watched around 700 films from about 54 countries spanning 130 years of history from the first film ever made in 1888. I've also directed two short films, written three screenplays, produced two stage plays, and over 100 pieces of film criticism. And contrary to how that may sound, I'm not citing it to boast, but much rather to justify the passion I'm going to take on as I now speak about the arts. Mediums of fiction, specifically film and literature, 
have always been at our disposal. Yes, the STEM subjects are rightfully commended for solving the world's problems, but I believe it's only the arts that teach us to solve our own. Knowing how committed we all are to logic, it's difficult to convince others of its importance nowadays. Works of fiction seem too colorful, too saturated to be realistic. But what if I told you they were only touched up reflections of our real lives? I'll begin from the most rudimentary of foundations. What exists in every work of fiction? The narrative arc. Introduction, problem, boiling point, explosion, resolution. We've seen it play out countless times, and it never gets old because it's exactly how conflicts play out in our real lives. Being introduced to dilemmas and solving them, it's what we do constantly. And though extensive sagas such as the Lord of the Rings novels or the 007 films may see that play out in extreme, blown-up fashions, the conflicts created are never for no reason which we seem to have trouble remembering in our real lives. That every action has a consequence, each twist a justification. And with books and films, they let us sit there, comfortably, absorbed but uninvolved, able to figure it out justly. When we try to reason with things in our real lives, there's so much that's taken into account. Emotion, bias, hyper-empathy, indifference, obligations that all sway the way we react. But fiction, fiction is its own world given to us, a world that nobody we know is in. And perhaps with that, it gives us the opportunity to be the fairest version of ourselves. We know why the Joker turned insane, why E.T. was in danger on Earth, why Tom Robinson loses the trial, how Gatsby was blinded by love, and how beauty was able to love the beast, so on and so forth. I'm citing the most popular stories of our time, but there are millions upon millions of examples. It comes down to knowing who the hero is and who the villain is, what turns one good and turns one bad seeing the mistake and its corresponding consequence, the action and reaction. I ask, why must we wait to be reminded of the consequences in our real lives? For the downfall to be real, the loss to be real, the suffering to be real and put in front of us, when we have countless alternate realities to teach us of our own. Not sure how to go about a negotiation, Watch Marlon Brando in The Godfather. Want to understand mental illness and others? Read Girl Interrupted, The Bell Jar. Watch A Beautiful Mind or Mahalan Drive. Want to be more laid back? Watch the entirety of the French New Wave, my personal favorite. Want to predict your or someone you know's struggles in reaching perfection? Black Swan, Whiplash, Raging Bull, or Read the Queen's Gambit. Want to know the dangers of being on top? Scarface, Citizen Kane, Sunset Boulevard, The Wolf of Wall Street, or read the picture of Dorian Gray. Want to get a secret out of someone? Read Agatha Christie, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, watch Chinatown, A Few Good Men, or The Departed. The answers are there. Every type of person, every type of situation, common or of the most extraordinary rarity. Stories of every career, every vice, every motive, every dream you may have, they are there. You might find them in postmodernist or contemporary literature, in the French New Wave, South Korean New Wave, the American Golden Age, or in German Expressionism, or online, or in a library. The point being, everything you fear has, in one way or another, been lived through already. The answers, the, the solutions, they're there, waiting to be seen. You just have to look at them. Now, I haven't too much fondness for conclusions, 
so I'll try to be blunt. If I, with my scant 15 years behind me, were to comment on our futures and the lives ahead of us, I would say we have two options. They're between now and later. Make the mistake now, learn from it later. Know what's wrong and do what's right. They won't teach you that in your textbooks. So lift your gaze to the people, the characters, the stories and the experiences. To come full circle, I suppose. I never used to like writing in pen, but it turned out to be the only reason I could finish this talk. That being said, there's not much else to say. So I'll end by going back 2,500 years to the words of history's greatest strategist, Sun Tzu. The victorious win the battle first, then go to war. While the defeated go to war first, then seek to win. And though our futures may seem complicated, they're really as simple as that. Thank you very much.